Tonight we'll be making up the uh, lesson that I inadvertently skipped last week. We covered in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now it's good to ask the question of your, to yourself, see, see how well you can answer it. Uh, what is God doing in Jesus Christ? Salvation is in him. And precisely, uh, what is the identity and nature of the new covenant? These are just good things to ponder, Amen. think upon. Some would answer, well, what, what God is basically doing is rescuing the lost. Well, he is rescuing the lost, of course. We're speaking about when we, hey, what is he doing? You mean what is he basically doing? What is, what is the root things that he is uh, doing? Some would feel that he's like invading the earth to make it more acceptable, make it a better place to live, this sort of thing. And still others, they, they have no concept about God doing something. I mean, this, this is like a fresh thought to them that God is doing something. And so they would uh, not know how to answer that. I find that very rarely in church circles is there any kind of reference to eternity or an eternal purpose or God displaying his wisdom. Of course, I know there's not much said about it because people don't comprehend it. That's why they don't say anything about it. Because you know by experience that when you see this, you, <laughs> you can't keep it quiet. You, you begin to see it. It's like everywhere in the scripture and all your thoughts are, seem to gravitate to this sort of thing. As soon as many, any man pose a question concerning God's purpose, Men have a tendency to wax philosophical and uh, give their opinion about it as soon as you, because they're kind of unfamiliar with this kind with this line of thinking. Well, I personally, I'm very grateful that we it's not a strange line of thinking to us yeah, to think about God's purpose, God's eternal purpose, yeah. that He has purposed in Himself before the foundation of the world, and that it's not strange language. I mean, look how far you come already. It's just look how far you've come. Yeah. That this isn't a strange language at all anymore. It's familiar. In fact, it's very delightsome to think about it. Men rather like to get down to matters pertaining to this world and what should we do and how can we improve things and so forth. Well, it's not that all of that is in is not is not valid. It's that it ranks way down. It ranks way down at the bottom of the totem pole. It yeah, isn't that all that important. Now, I spend some time developing this because it's important to me that people see see this, that they have some understanding in this, what we're talking about. So think about this as an introductory thought. Consider what God has done without the involvement of humanity at all. Now you can start with the creation itself, yeah. and uh, there was in the devastating flood, there was a dispersion of the people at Shinar, and then God all of a sudden he picks out one man, and he tells this one man that he intends to make many nations out of them, and one of those nations is going to have the priority with him, and he is going to then, from that nation, bring up a person that will bless the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> and then he did bring that person and bless the whole world, laid the iniquities of the world upon him, took sin away, reconciled the world to God, blotted out the handwriting of warnings against us, ended the law as a means to righteousness, and a lot of other things. 
Does anyone really think that making the world a better place to live would require all of that kind of work? Is there, is there any sane person that thinks that making you a better man or making you a better home or whatever, do you really think it would call for, this is a divine investment, a divine investment that large and that extensive? Do you really think that things are that hard for God? Do you really think that God even has a second thought about the possibility of changing people? Why God can change people however he wants. He can harden them, soften them, illuminate them, blind them, slay them, make them live. God can do all this. So here's not what he's demonstrating, that he can do this. If a person doesn't know this, they just have to believe the record God's given of his son and all the history he's recorded. God is showing that he employs wisdom to do all that, not just power. God could just blind everybody. Or he could open everybody's eyes. That's how God is. He could do this. But this wouldn't de develop the idea of a wise God or a beneficent God or a righteous God. See, God's demonstrating all these things in what, he, in what he's doing. So Paul is kind of speaking with this in mind. We're going to be in verses 5 and 6, a mystery that was not made known in previous ages, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and to the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Look how particular, <laughs> how, he particular how particular he is. Yeah. Partakers of the promise of the gospel in Christ through the, by the Spirit. It's, remar it's remarkable how particular he is. Now I would venture to say that the average Professing Christian doesn't think that the acceptance of the Gentiles is that big a deal. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, this is a mystery yeah. that God intended to do this yeah. and hid it. He's going to accept it. So that's what we're going to look at. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. Now, he's launching into what he refers to as my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's the fourth verse. My knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now, he's elaborating on his knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So you think he talked about Christ. Huh? Well, he's talking about the Gentiles. And it just, just to show you, how, show you how complicated this is, that Christ was a means to realize this end. See? God had an infinite lot more in mind than you or me. It's all involved in the mystery of Christ. Before he could do this, <clears throat> they, this mystery is going to mention, which is making the Gentiles fellow heirs with, this, with the Jews. Before he could do this, all the sin of the world had to be taken away. And before he could take away all the sin of the world, he had to define sin so men could kind of get hold of what it was. Before this could be done, the devil had to have the mortal bruise delivered to him. Before this could be done. Principalities and powers that were governing the world had charge of nations. There's probably one has charge of our nation. It probably is. Probably is a evil principality has charge of this nation. He's called for this president, called for that president. He has called for this custom, called for that custom, called for a denigration of Christ. He, he's able to do it because the people are weak. These principalities and powers had to have a 
they had to be plundered before God could carry this carry this out. Uh, not that he couldn't carry it out, but he's, remember, it's his, his, he's got to make his wisdom known. So it's, it's just not carrying it out. That's not the point. It's got to be carried out righteously. It has to be carried out in such a manner you can see his love. It has to be carried out in such a manner that you can see his wrath and righteousness and so forth. Now that takes wisdom. Amen. A lot of what you do, very little of you may be in it. You may do it what we call perfunctorily. Just, you just <laughs> do it without, eh, that's not how God works. God works every, this work is a display of his person. A lot of what you do isn't a display of your person. Some work, some work you do is very minuscule, it's not that important, it's very, but God doesn't have anything like that that he does. It was God's, God had to make sure that all the attention of all of heaven was on what he was doing. The heart, that all of heaven could say the whole earth is full of his glory. See, before he could launch into this, fulfilling this, all this had to be done. There couldn't be any distracting element. There could be no question about who was doing this. There could be no sloppy views of God among the people that, among whom he's going to do this. They had to have a grasp of who God was. They had to be able to shake when they're in the presence of God and tremble in the presence of God. That capacity had to be there. God had to reveal himself in such a manner as people who saw him knew <laughs> you don't flaunt yourself before God. See, and so he raised up certain people say, hey, let me tell you something. When God, I just heard God's voice. I hid. I just heard. I just heard him coming, yeah. and I hid. And then he, we're not talking about a man led a profligate life here. We're talking about a man that did one thing he shouldn't do, yeah. the one thing he shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. All right, that had to be cultured and developed mm -hmm. before God did this. There's a purpose that drove all of these things, and He's going to tell us what it was. Was behind. He was. He was like setting up the chessboard. Yeah. He's he was putting everything in place so he could do this work. So we're considering a purpose that required the removal of sin. It required a new creation. It required a continual change that would consummate in being conformed to the image of Christ. All that had to be in place when this project got underway. Now, in, in <coughs> the nation that was going to come from Abraham, as we said, they have said before, their first initial work was the, they were the people through whom the Savior would come. He'd come into an environment in which he could be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, it wasn't an ideal environment. We understand that. But it was the best environment for seriously minded people. Yeah. Uh -huh. For people who wanted the Lord, they had the scriptures, they had the temple service, they had they had things that they could shape their thinking around, and that was the purpose, to produce an environment for Jesus to come into. Now in other ages, other ages, it's periods of time. It suggests that there are inferior ages and superior ages. There have been superior people that lived in inferior ages. And there have been inferior people who lived in superior ages. The ages are important. What age you're living in is important. If you're living in the pre-law age, all right, God doesn't expect a lot, just the kind of basic fundamental stuff. But if you're living in the age in which the son of righteousness has risen with healing in his wings, oh, now you God expects a lot more out of people in that age. In other ages, 
They didn't know what we're going to talk about now. There's A's prior to the law. It's identified as from Adam to Moses. 2,500 years, that's, that's considerably more than a third of the entire history of the world. Hmm? Entire history of the world is a little over 6,000 years. So you're well over, well over a third of the world was one age. In that age, there were some, there were some important people. There was Adam and Seth and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They lived in that age. But there weren't many great people that lived in that age. Just a handful, just a handful. 2,500 years now we're talking about. Just a handful of what God would consider significant people lived. Oh, there's a lot of worldly dignitaries that lived in that 2,500 years. The inventors of math, the inventors of medicine, the inventors of libraries, the inventors of language, they all lived in that period. They're not mentioned in the Bible. Not significant people. Then there was a, there was A's from the giving of the law to John the Baptist. Now people were expected, uh, more was expected out of people in that age than it is before it. There are people like Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb and Samuel and David and Solomon, the prophets. And more was revealed, see. More was expected than was expected in previous age. It's important people see this. See, I don't think this is generally seen. I think, I think people see God as kind of always the same and whoever, wherever, and whenever someone turns to him, he gladly accepts him. See, but no, God is a revealing God. And when he reveals something, it's man's business to know what he's revealed. That's why it's so serious to live in an age where scriptural literacy is at a high level during an age in which the highest revelation has been given. There's no way. You can't sweep it under the rug. You can't excuse it. God's not that kind of God. In God's kingdom, age two is expected to be better than age one. People living in the second age are expected to be further advanced than people in the first age. That's the way the kingdom is. Now we're living in a time in the highest age of all when the most of the people haven't come up to age one yet. That's how far back things have gone. Atheism is growing in our country. Well, it'd be bad enough at age one. It would have been inexcusable back then. Now it's even more serious. And consequently, it's more difficult to get out of it. Yeah. See, sin is like, like enslaves the person. The less that is available from God, the greater the advantage is given to sin. And sin soon gets a hold of people. And it's, it's impossible to get out of the grasp of it. They have to be delivered from it. But if they don't know God, deliverance is way off. Amen. Long way off. More was revealed in, from uh, the law to John the Baptist. Now, it's during this age that a, a significant division took place among the population of the earth. Two distinct groups were formed during this second age the Jew and the Gentile. This age lasted 1,500 years. And that um, those major divisions existed. One of these people were highly favored, one was not. One received from God, one did not. One was accepted by God, one was not. 
God's showing the angel something here. It's like he says to the angels, before I'm through, I'm going to take people from both bodies. People had the advantage, didn't have the advantage. <coughs> Knew God, didn't know God. We're not, I was not merciful to them. I was merciful to them. Another group, I wasn't merciful to them. I show you how great I am, how wise I am. I'm going to bring delegates from both groups and I'm going to merge them together. Now, oh, there's a great work. There's a great work. Now, the, this was not made known to the sons of men in previous ages. Now, there's some things that godly men were able to deduce. They could think about something that wasn't revealed, and they could come up with a pretty good conclusion. For instance, there's no revelation that God had revealed anything about the resurrection of the dead, but Job, he thought about death, and he said, though my flesh is eaten by worms, yet in my flesh I'll see God. He, he, he reasoned it out yeah. without a specific, <laughs> there's things like that. But you can do it. Now, there's no reference in scripture that God ever told Abraham about a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. There's nothing in scripture said God revealed that to Abraham, but Abraham, he, he walked with God, he believed God, and as he was in the world, he concluded as another city. Yeah. Is no record in scripture that God revealed a heavenly country to the patriarchs of old? At least I never read it. And yet they assumed the posture of strangers and pilgrims and saw a better country that is a heavenly, huh? See, they reasoned this out. All right, but this thing we're talking about, nobody could reason it out. That's what he's saying. You might be able to reason the dead are going to be raised. You might be able to reason that there's a better place. But nobody was able to reason this out, that the Jew and the Gentile were going to be merged into one group. That nobody could figure out. Now, there are holy conclusions that can be reached, but there are some that can't. <laughs> have to be revealed. When it comes to matters of God's eternal purpose, you can't reason it out. It has to be revealed. Amen. Now, it, was no, it wasn't revealed in previous ages. He's, he's going to tell us it was the Gentiles being made fellow heirs. It was not revealed in former ages as, as, it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, Paul writes very precisely at this point because he's addressing a mystery that hasn't been known. There are still a lot of people who don't know this mystery. There are still a lot of people, church people, preaching people, leading people, Christian leaders that don't know this mystery. So he's very, very precise in how he how he presents it. Notice how he says, as it is now revealed. Let me give you what some of the other versions, how they translate this. But the revelation of it has now been made known. I'm, I'm going to show you that this, that's not precise enough. It's the basic Bible English. As the Spirit is now revealing it. That, that's pretty good. As fully as it is now. It's the Williams Bible. That's, that's pretty good. As now it was revealed. Until God's Spirit told it. But God has revealed it now. All right, now. I'm going to stick by these precise words because these, these words, this precision is reflected in the original text. 
He's not saying it wasn't then, but it is now. That's true, but that's not exactly what he's saying. He said it wasn't revealed then like it has been now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I understand you could say, you could be comparing it wasn't then and the like it means it is now, but uh, follow me here. The word now, it's a key word now. It's not one relating to chronological time. Like men would say, right now. That's, that's, that's not how it's being used. This is a kingdom way of referring to a period that commenced with the exaltation of Christ and the enthronement of him at his right hand. That's essential. You've got to learn to think this way. Now does it mean it's present time. There are, a lot, there are some religious movements that say this is what God is doing now. They mean the 20th century. I'm going to say this is not how God uses this word. Notice this statement in Acts 17.31. God has commanded all men everywhere. He says, now God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now, now God is commanding all men everywhere to repent. God, the times past, God winked at ignorance. As he, passed, he passed over it in long suffering. But now, now, what, what do you mean now? Now that Jesus is at the right hand of God having accomplished what was necessary to launch this work since then. Here's another, Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God is made known. Now. It's now that, see, now that Jesus is reigning. Here's another, Romans 6.22. Now men are being made free from sin. Now you are free from sin. See, now what? Now today? No. Since Jesus has completed the foundational work and is reigning at the right hand of God, since then, yeah. since then, yeah. men have been made free from sin. Yeah. Were they lived in the first century or the 21st century? Yeah. Romans 7, 6, now we are delivered from the law. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, now God has placed the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Ephesians 2.13, now those who are afar off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. Philippians 2.12, now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Hebrews 8.6, now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. 1 Peter 2.10, now the Gentiles formal who had not obtained mercy have obtained mercy. Now, now this makes for confidence. If you think of now as I can do it today, I can, I can do it, you'll get discouraged. But if you think, well, now that Jesus is in heaven, yeah. now that Jesus is interceding, yeah. now that Jesus is mediating, yeah. now that Jesus is reigning, now that Jesus has all power in heaven and earth, now, and then you, Amen. that's the perspective of this text that we're talking about. It's critical that men... Learn to reason from the perspective of an exalted, reigning, interceding, and mediating Christ. Amen. Here's where you come in. You can help people to think this way because people, there's not a lot of this kind of thinking. That's right. Kingdom effectuality is all traced back. Kingdom effectuality is never traced back to the day of Pentecost. Now that Pentecost has come, that's not the reasoning of Scripture. It's the reason of some people since A.D. 31, you know. That's not the reason of Scripture. Or some people, now that the scriptural canon has been completed, they think that's the way they think. They think that's a secret to everything becoming stabilized just after the Bible canon has been written. The Bible's all in place. Or now that the new covenant has been put in motion. No, it's now that Jesus has been enthroned. Amen. As used here, the word now is defined as the period during which the mystery that was formerly hidden is being revealed and is made known. Since Jesus has been enthroned. 
the plundering of despotic principalities and powers and the ending of the law for righteousness, that had to take place before this mm -hmm. disclosure of what God is doing. This is how God is. God doesn't tell people what he's doing till the resources have been developed that they need to see it and live in it. Yeah. See, that's a, that's a kingdom principle. That's just how God is. So God's not going to tell people a lot of details until they've received what they need to live by those details. Once you know this, you're not so picky about the saints that live back. You don't try and find fault with them. Because there hadn't been a lot of things disclosed to them, and they, weren't ex they were not expected to live like you're expected to live. So if you're living beneath where they lived, you, you are in trouble. Doesn't make a difference who you are either. Yes. trying to see is that when um, Brother Paul went out to minister, God didn't just say, okay, you're the one who's going to deal with all the men who um, are against you and who say bad things about you and me, and I'm just going to let you deal with it. You do whatever you want. He gave, um, like you said, the Lord will give you resources. He gave Paul the resource and the yeah. words to say. He didn't just leave him on his own to do this mission that God sent him on. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yeah, really yeah. So, saying um, about Christ reigning presently, right now, at the right hand of God, the, this this uh, satanic attack and this, this doctrines that are gone out that say that, that they state that Jesus is going to reign. Yeah. Coming and to earth. It, to and coming to earth is going to set up a kingdom over there. I mean, this is everywhere I go. I this is everywhere. I know. This, 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 and so it does, it puts people to sleep. They don't realize the resources that they need are from a reigning right. Christ right now Amen. at the right hand of God. If they're going to overcome sin, they're going to have to get these resources from him, yeah, and yet they don't even know he's reigning. Yeah. Yeah. Now here, here with the Bible, here's, here's the flaw in their reasoning. They associate the power of Christ with overcoming the enemy. But in apostolic doctrine, the power of Christ is associated with bringing the sons home to glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Jesus hasn't been exalted to subdue the enemies. Yeah. That's just going to take one appearance. Yeah. Yeah. The light of his countenance, phew, they're destroyed. That's right. So that, that's not why Jesus has been exalted. Jesus has been exalted because it is difficult to get people from earth to glory. In fact, if God doesn't do it, it's not going to be done. It can't be done by angels as strong as angels are. Angels could kill 185,000 at one time. Angels could overthrow a despot that was making Persia the government of the world. But no, no angel or a group of angels can get you from heaven to earth, or from earth to heaven. That takes power, see? So this concept of power, invariably, that's what it is. They think of power as subduing the enemy. But we are saved. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's right, See, that's, that's what the power of God is used for. So unless I know that, I'll buy into these other, the, these other doctors. They sound, to the mind of the flesh, they sound really smart and intellectual. And now we need them because you know how the devil's running roughshod over the world and how... The enemies of Christ, oh, I'm looking forward to when Jesus finally comes. We can have done with this. Well, actually, Jesus is running roughshod over the world's powers. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Amen. The stones are rolling. That's right. It's rolling. That's right. yeah. And there's kingdoms already fallen that are greater than any kingdom of earth today. There are global kingdoms that have fallen. There's others that have fallen. During our time, they've fallen. Yeah. We saw the fall of Russia. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Well, not, nobody thought that happened. I, when I was in school, nobody thought Russia would fall. You're going to have to redo some books, too, because they said Russia was that yeah. great bear, whatever was going to come down, all that doctrine. And England's <laughs> fallen, and it once ruled the world. Yeah, that's right. England once ruled the world. Uh -huh. 
and took continents unto itself. Huh? It fell. So the power is not in the decimation of governments or people or enemy. The power is in bringing sons to glory. Now, how stupid must it look to angelic host to see people trying to overcome sin by methodology created by men? Now, how must that look to Gabriel and to Michael? They know the power of God. There's a power of God unto salvation. And anything that has to do with overcoming sin has to do with salvation. Amen. You can't overcome sin by employing human power. Amen. It can't be done. And yet people, they're, they're trying it. Yeah. We won't name any names, but there's a lot of churches right here that are trying it. About Easter time, there's a lot of churches with which we are familiar that adopt 40 days of purpose. They buy Rick Warren's book, they read the little daily devotion, and for 40 days they try and hone up on their purpose, then they put their book in the bookshelf and wait for next year. So this is going on, people. Don't doubt it for a moment. That why? Because they don't see that salvation is being carried out by divine power. We are kept by the power of God under salvation. And that power is exhibited in wisdom. It's not what we call raw power. Just it's done wisely. So, so you don't lose any of the wheat. Now, it's, it's that it never has been revealed as it is now revealed to the holy, <laughs> to the holy apostle. Of it wasn't revealed to Judas. Ju yeah. Judas never got in on this. Right. To the holy apostles and prophets. Holy means set apart for God, dedicated. Morally pure, right. Rather, the loftiness of the word is seen in the fact that God Himself is said to be holy. So that all right now we <laughs> this is a big word we're talking about here. Amen. They were the made holy, yeah, but when you're made holy, you are holy. Amen. Made holy doesn't mean you aren't holy, but God pretends like you're holy. That's right. People that are made holy are holy. They live holy. They act holy. They talk holy. It's revealed a holy prophets and apostle. Apostle is a delegate or a messenger sent forth with orders. The apostle is not primarily a term denoting authority, like boss or this sort of thing. They are first in the church. As First Corinthians 12, 28 says, but they're apostles that are sent out with a message. Their strength is what they say, not what they do. Do. Amen. What's important to see? He revealed it now to his holy apostles and prophets. There's 12 apostles to the Jews. Their names are the, on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem, which is basically, is basically a Jewish temple uh -huh. to which the Gentiles have been added. Amen. That's why they're found, the 12 apostles are the foundation stones of it. Some stumble at this. Yes. Only recently a brother said to me that how many apostles were there? I said, well, there are 12 apostles to the Jews and one to the Gentiles. Wrong. Then that means there's 13 apostles. So only 12. And he told me, he said, you know, Peter dropped the ball. He took, he, he took too much on himself when he... When they he announced that we're going to choose someone to take Judas's place. In fact, he said, I think probably the writer goofed up on that. Oh, he was he was he was here. This is the man that came here last Friday. I've talked to him about this before. I told him, Well, Jesus appeared to 
the 12. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said he appeared to the 12 before Paul was an apostle. I may have to look that I may have to look that up again. But he, what I'm saying here is that there's a lot of confusion on this issue here about who the apostles are. There are a great number of people that think Paul took Judas's place. Historically and contemporarily. A lot of people think that. That's not the case. The holy apostles. Now, two other men are called apostles that were not one of the twelve were Paul. Barnabas is called an apostle in Acts 14, 14. And James is called an apostle. James, the Lord's brother, is called an apostle in, in Galatians 1, 19. Or in Acts, yeah, uh, Galatians 1, 19. Said the Lord appeared unto the apostles, that he means James, the Lord's brother. Although these were not numbered of the twelve, they were men sent out with a message, especially in Dude. Amen. Neither of those men received a revelation of this mm -hmm. mystery. It finally made it finally made sense to James that the Gentiles were included. In Acts 15, he's, and he seemed to have, seemed to kind of open up to him because that's what I talked about, the tabernacle of David, which would depict the body of Christ as the Jews and Gentiles gathered in one tent. The thing was specifically revealed to the, to the holy apostles and prophets. Now, the prophets of reference, these aren't the Old Testament prophets. Because we're told they didn't see this. They desire to look into these things. So that's not the ones he's talking about here. When he talked about the foundation of the apostles and prophets, about laying the foundation, the apostles of old, they foretold the manner of Christ. But they didn't foretell that the Jews and Gentiles were going to be one body. They hinted at it, but it did, this was not revealed to them. These are the prophets that are set in the church. Amen. Ephesians 4.11. Set them in church. First, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And he mentions prophets as one of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12.28. He said, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, and etc. Those are all teaching ministries. Apostles, prophets, teachers. They all had a message. Yes. Paul said this was revealed, this thing was revealed to apo holy apostles and prophets. Mm -hmm. Now, prophets, they could discern the truth and proclaim it. They ranked evidently behind the apostles, but God unveiled this mm -hmm. to some of these prophets. We're not, we don't know who in particular. Paul, one time when he was preaching, he said, Now, if any man claim to be a prophet, let him acknowledge the things I say unto you are, are the commandments of God. So it could be that this was the sense of the prophet. They could, yeah, they, they saw what the apostles were saying. Oh, yeah. And passed it on. It revealed, now this mystery he's talking about was revealed to the apostles and prophets. These were faithful men. See, if it was revealed to men today, it had died, probably died out with his generation. But it, it, it was revealed to faithful, these faithful men, and they passed this on. With this this uh, message had been hidden from the foundation of the world, and it was revealed to them by the Spirit. Yeah. See how particular God is? Yeah. He didn't like whisper it in their ear. Yeah. By the Spirit. The Spirit made it known to them. Now, what, <laughs> what is the mystery? Now, I will tell you that you'll be hard-pressed to find a person anywhere at any time that thinks this is significant. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's the mystery. That's the thing that's made known. Now, you see, you make this a project. 
See if you can find somebody that thinks that's kind of a remarkable accomplishment. And I think you'll find, if you find someone, you'll be so happy you will jump with joy. It's not generally known. Why is it known? Because it hasn't been made known. I'd venture to say that it would be very difficult to find a single person that had understanding on this matter. That the Gentiles should be, I want to look at it, that the Gentiles should be. Now this is not should be from Sinai, which means ought to be. It, <laughs> this is should be from Mount Zion, as in shall be. Amen. It's a different kind. <laughs> It's a different kind of a should be. In other words, this is what God has determined. Yes, amen. God has determined that the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs and partakers of the promise and, and members of the body and partakers of the promise that's been given to the Jews. The only question is who and how many and all this and that. God is the one that determines that. Now let's look at this. Fellow heirs. <coughs> Other versions say members of the body or members together of one body or members of the same body. They just or members together of one body and members of the same body. It's that it is an amazing thing that people that were cultured were joined together with people that were uncultured yeah. in the ways of God we're talking about. People that heard from God were joined by people who hadn't heard from God. <laughs> people who are not a people were joined by those who were a people, were a people, were joined to those who were a people. People who had not obtained mercy were joined to people who had obtained mercy. See this, this defies human reasoning as to why there's a distinction. Normally the thought of a distinction means I don't want the other ones. So I'm going to take these because I don't want the other ones. And some Jews concluded that. Some Jews concluded this. But this wasn't the case at all. It wasn't that he didn't want the Gentiles. It wasn't that he rejected the Gentiles. It wasn't that he was going to wait. He's going to bring them in by another way. Just to show you, you can't make an idol out of the means. See, some people idolize the means rather than the one who uses the means. So just to show you that the means isn't what gets you in, but God, he's reserved the Gentiles over here for a season. And he determined that they were, he was going to join them. They were going to be fellow heirs. Now, if this is the purpose perceived before the foundation of the world, which he stated earlier it was, then the acceptance of the Jews is not God's reaction to the rejection of the, the acceptance of the Gentiles is not God's reaction to the rejection of the Jews. Amen. Not if this purpose was determined before the foundation of the world. It also means that the Jews haven't been cut off. Amen. That's right. Because if they have been, we got a part of a body. Because yeah. uh -huh. they're going to join both together in one body. All right? Did he has it? Has he amputated some part of the body? No. He cut off some parts of the tree. Mm -hmm. Cut off some parts of the olive tree, but he didn't chop the tree down. That's right. Not at all. Lose the Gentiles too, because right. they've been grafted into yeah, that tree. Amen. Now this, um, it's it's uh, amazing when you consider it that um, God created the distinction. Yeah. I mean, he, <laughs> some right. people would avoid all kinds of problems, yeah. but not God. He creates the problem, the <laughs> dilemma, in order to show how wise He That's is right. of being able to do it anyway. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Now, they were going to be partakers of the promise, which was given to Abraham and then to, and to Israel. To Israel pertained the promises. Romans 9, 
3 through 5 says. God's promise in Christ refers to what he accomplished in Christ, being promised of old time. The way it was stated, it looked like what he did was for the Jews. And it was never clearly stated that it was going to also be for the Gentiles. It, the Gentiles were said they would come. They would come to the Gen Jews. They would come to Jerusalem. They would, God would lift up his hand to them. There's a number of texts that spoke about the acceptance of the Gentiles, but you will not find one where they were joined together unless it's uh, 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 the one that's in Isaiah that states that he was going to make a third part uh, out of Assyria and a third part Egypt and a third part Israel and they'd be gathered together into one. And then you, you kind of have to stretch this. What I'm pointing out is that God didn't leak this information out. Yeah. Uh -huh. That the Gentiles were eventually going to be joined, made fellow heirs, by the gospel. So this doesn't happen where the gospel's not preached. That's the means through which there, this is accomplished. You can't be accomplished by another gospel. You can't preach another gospel and through that other gospel join the Jews and the Gentiles together. Uh -huh. Amen. You may be able to do that like politically or something like that, but you can't do this in one body in Christ. Can't be done. As I mentioned, this is a word that cannot be found in the prophets. They spoke of the Gentiles coming to the Lord Psalm 86, 9, seeking the Lord, Isaiah eleven ten, the Messiah given for a light to the Gentiles, Isaiah 42, 6, the Gentiles coming to the Jews, asking about their God, Isaiah 60, 3 and 5, coming to Jerusalem, Jeremiah 3, 17, inquiring of the Jews, Zechariah 8, 23, being given to Messiah as inheritance, Psalm 2, 8, turning to the Lord, Psalm 22, 27, being exalted, God being exalted among them, Psalm 46, 10, and a host of other texts, but it doesn't, he didn't reveal they were going to be joint heirs or fellow heirs with the Jews. <laughs> Equal rights. All the promises applied to them, even though they weren't, quote, made to them. Oh, this is a marvelous uh, thing. Isaiah, as I said, gave a hint about this oneness. In Isaiah 19, 24, and 25, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Syria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. So they're joined together. So they, now you can look back and read that, and oh, all right, you can get, <laughs> you can get the joining together. But you, it wasn't revealed before. That's the benefit for which the Gentiles were being prepared by being isolated. That's the benefit they were being prepared for by being having their eyes closed so they couldn't see the truth. That's why a prophet wasn't given to them, so God could show you. A nation can be born in a day. Yeah. God doesn't need a lot of time now that the works, now that the spade work's been done. God doesn't need a lot of time. I don't doubt that the whole world would be converted, probably could, could be in a matter of days, given our communication and so forth. That's what God wants people to see. That salvation is not hard for God. It's hard for man. So he sets up a, a social s network that makes salvation look well nigh impossible. For anybody but the Jews. 
Then he reveals, oh, that's not, what I, that's not the message I'm getting across at all. I'm getting across that salvation belongs to me. And I save who I want to save. And even if nobody, even if they didn't seek me, I'll be found to them that sought me not. <laughs> that's God. This is the salvation we're talking about. See, what does that mean to us? Once you see this, you present your body a living sacrifice to God as a thank offering to God that you got in on this. You cannot explain how you got into this. You can see, well, Christ died for everybody. God, Christ died for the whole world, and that's true. But if Jesus hadn't been enthroned, accomplishing that would be, you couldn't, you couldn't have confidence in that. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to shape your life around it. That's something else. Now, I'm going to make a, a charge here. There's a lot of people, I trust no one here, that are not living for God. That's just the bottom line of the matter. They call themselves Christians, but they're not living for God. I'm going to tell you why. They don't see this that we talked about. They don't see it. Once you see it, you know that what God, if God has, if all the good stuff you read about in the Bible, you can have. <laughs> that's what it boils down to. If that's true, it puts the confidence in your heart to get out there and press toward the mark, call on the name of the Lord, seek his face, seek the things that are above, because you're persuaded they're for you. I insist that the majority of Christians do not believe these things are for them. That's why they don't seek him. And they don't believe they're for them because the secret hasn't been declared. <laughs> I think I'll close there, but I want to work on that some more. It's quite a marvelous, Amen. so simple. It sounds so simple on the surface, but it, it's not simple. Not when you've got a gallery of angels watching on and a devil waiting to accuse, mm -hmm. yeah. find some flaw. See, given all that, you say, whoa. It's marvelous. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yeah, Brother Ricky. Said of the Gentile war, remember the Lord said, I was found of them that sought me not. Me not. That's right. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how many advantages you give. The Jews are an example of this. Look at all the advantages That's that they right. were given by God, and yet they were really no different than the Gentile world. So what we have to conclude is, it's not of him that wills, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. That's right. And he's the distinctive factor. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Particularly delighted now to see this point, how God pays attention to details. Now Peter went and preached to Cornelius, and, yeah. they, and they concluded that well, this salvation is to the Gentiles That's also. Right. But uh, Paul was sent, yeah, to the Gent to open all of this up. That's now, he, right. he came to declare the mystery, what That's God right. was really doing, what all this was to mean. And so how now God that chose, he had his own apostle uh, uh, to go to the Gentiles, right. particularly to declare this this specific message withheld it from the one he withheld it from the Jews the veils over their eyes mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. once once you see what Paul said you see this you see this all over the scriptures once once your eyes have been opened but see there what, what they, God dedicated a man That's right. you know, amen. To, to reveal this particular aspect amen. of the history amen this if, if it is true that the gospel is the power of God and salvation, and it is, then anywhere the gospel is not being proclaimed, then this this becomes like a not only a mystery, it's shut up. They they, right. they can't understand because anything if you if, once you hear the gospel and you know that God has an eternal purpose or something that He's planned to do yeah. before He ever made the world, it makes God God. Yeah. I mean, otherwise God just a just a nice person up there that has lived forever. Yeah. And maybe knows everything, or maybe knows everything is going to happen, but he doesn't really purpose it. He doesn't really change history. He makes history. But until you see him like that, it's it's really hard to put these things together in your mind and no, you be able to re, you know, come up with a conclusion. Well, then 
if I serve him, if I'm if I'm given to see these things, then serving him really is a is just a product of faith. It's That's just a right. product of it. Let's say when you come to God, you a person comes to God, and they have trouble accepting whether God will accept them or not. And I've I've dealt with people like this. They stumble over this. That, that, they can't see how God would want to save them. This is how the Gentiles, how else would the Gentiles have got in? If God didn't want to save the Gentiles, how would they ever have got in? Right. Why would Jesus ever have died? See, once you see this, you have the courage to yeah, draw near and call upon the name of the Lord. But if this is hidden from you, Whatever, whatever religion, however much religion a person has, if it's not based on the gospel, it's powerless. Amen. And if anything's going to be done, they're going to have to resort to something man's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because God doesn't work where the gospel's not preached for good. That's right. It's a, a good practice to, uh, to do once in a while when you read about Israel in the Old Testament scriptures. To acknowledge that that that's just what it means it's Israel and we in this age we Gentile believers have grown accustomed to reading those old scriptures and when it says Israel we think the church when it says Jerusalem we think the heavenly city Jerusalem yeah. <laughs> but prior to Christ that is not what it meant exactly right and when, exactly when the right. Lord talked about <laughs> Abraham's seed and Israel and Jerusalem and all he was talking about Israel after the flesh and, right. and all those promises that were made to them it was it's to them that's right and not until Christ ascended were we brought into that and it's it's good to go back and, and look at it from that point of view mm -hmm. every now and then yeah. amen yes I particularly like the point you made which is a very good point about the word now uh -huh. everything hinges Yes. Or what Christ done. Yes. And uh, that was that was very good. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people will go back and they'll now that we have been given the New Testament church, yes. you know, we can <laughs> yeah, proceed. I know about that. Now that we figured out the plan of salvation. Yeah. Uh -huh. And but it but it's no it's that now that Christ has been exalted. Yeah. That's that's the so time. Let me go back to eighteen ninety six to the Azuzu revival. I'd never heard of it till we moved to this area, but it's got working. And they think things started there. Ah, things didn't start there. Some of the things things started with the Reformation. That they were recovered. Any legitimate revival is just a recovery of the of the basics. <laughs> that's what it, that's what it is. The things that through which the power is administered. Yeah. I know men that actually read. More about the founder of the Reformation movement than they do in the scriptures. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> yeah. I know. And pretty soon you adopt, you adopt the jargon of those writers, and you think, and the person who does th thinks he's reasoning according to scripture, but his 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 vocabulary is shaped by the movement. I've been delivered. I can't remember the man's name anymore. <laughs> <laughs> a great deliverance, I'll tell you. Any, anyone else tonight? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation of the mystery, for the glory of being united and fellow heirs with all that everywhere call upon the name of the Lord. We bless your name for the wisdom of this great salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.